Good afternoon, good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us for this digital session of the National Ergonomics Conference and Ergo Expo. We've got a great speaker and a very timely topic here today. We are grateful that you joined us to hear about the best ergonomic strategies for preventing injuries and advancing total worker health in 2022. This is a, a, a big topic, and we know NIOSH has been doing a lot of work on total worker health. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad we have our speaker here today to take us through this session. Uh, the session is sponsored by Dorn, and our speaker today is Kevin Lombardo. Kevin leads the strategy, development, and expansion plans for the company and oversees Dorn's focus on developing innovative solutions for pain mitigation with an emphasis on reducing organizations' future costs with evidence-based, result-oriented programs. Before we get Kevin on the line, I just want to remind you that this session is being recorded and it will be available for playback in about a week at ergoexpo.com. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you, Rachel, and welcome everybody. As Rachel mentioned, we're gonna take a little bit different tack around ergonomic injuries. We're gonna talk about uh, the risks and things that are happening from 2020, 2021, some of the uh, new trends that have come out because of COVID, people working at home or people on site, so forth. But we're also gonna layer in a conversation around total worker health. And as you can see in the agenda, a little bit around mental health awareness as well and wellness. And it's a different topic and it's a slightly different take. And I, I really want everybody to engage as much as possible, ask questions at the end, because for some of you, this might be new, some of these topics. For others, you're already doing this stuff and maybe this is just a reinforcement of what you're doing. But we're seeing a real trend of changes that are happening that organizations are now identifying the impact of stress and mental health related items on ergonomic injuries. And I think it's important that ergonomists, safety professionals, other folks in this arena start doing that as well. So with the agenda out of the way, let's uh, kind of talk about things as we're seeing them. Today, we're gonna to talk about on-site ergonomics and the state of ergonomic injuries. We'll touch on your remote workers. Uh, you're going to see the data that 58% of people are now working remote. Uh, at one point, I think it got as high as around 65% of non-manufacturing, non-distribution type folks who are working remotely. Uh, I think somewhere it'll settle around 40 to 45%. And then we want to talk about mental health and wellness. And how do we bring this together in more of a holistic approach to injury prevention? So uh, Rachel mentioned NIOSH. Uh, NIOSH, we've been a fan of NIOSH for many, many years. Uh, at Dorn, our corporate philosophy is centered around NIOSH's total worker health model. And the reality of it is to simplify it, total worker health really means taking a more holistic approach to looking at people and how they operate, the risks that are in the environments, uh, the preventative measures, and start thinking about how an organization works together between safety, EHS, er ergonomists, and, and wellness folks. A good example is last year we did a webinar, and I think we had about 30 wellness directors. These were global folks. I'd say there were five or six of them, not a majority, but five or six of them that said, you know, this past year is the first time I sat down with our safety people. We started combining our numbers. We started thinking about things a little bit differently around that total worker health model. And so at Dorn, uh, because total worker health is trademarked for NIOSH, we kind of look at things we call it body behavior and environment. Uh, we're also starting to think about mindfulness in that model. And that is our replication of total worker health. And so when we talk to people, we really try to talk around that idea. A good example, we met with a client a few years ago and the head nurse who was ahead of our program came to me and said, hey, do not mention that total worker health. We don't do that at this company. Said, okay. So I looked in the room, the people she brought in were safety, ergonomists, operations, wellness, benefits. And I said, you know, Gene said I shouldn't mention total worker health, but folks, you're practicing it you're all here at the table. You're all interested in the programming that we're doing and the impact it's having on employees. So you're practicing total worker health every day. You may not call it that, but you're practicing it. 
So I just want you to keep that in mind as I go through the rest of the slides, just kind of keep that in mind that a framework, a filter of total worker health, how these things might fit into the programs you're already doing, things that you're considering doing, or things that may pop up today. You say, you know what, we ought to really look at that. So let's just kind of, uh, you know, do some things and, and talk about where things are at. So, you know, we take surveys all the time at Dorn. We survey people on LinkedIn, we survey our customers, we survey our 20,000 database. And we get data back from folks. And you could see that the number one or two issue for most people is ergonomic related injuries. And I will tell you that the wording was different prior to COVID. COVID came, nobody talked to us during the summer and then people started talking to us during the fall. And we started saying, well, what's happening? It's the ergonomic injuries. It's the ergonomic risk. And maybe it's not even injuries, it's risk. It's ergonomic risk. Was there started becoming the number one um, identifier for most organizations coming out of COVID. Now, whether that was because they had to send people home and you had the deconditioning issue, whether it was um, there was a reduction across the board of musculoskeletal MSDs that the people started seeing increasing again after people came back to work, whatever the reason was, ergonomic related issues became number one or number two in most people's mind. And then they fall into the categories that you all know. So we, again, we're, we're survey uh, happy around here. We do a lot of surveys of folks and, and get a lot of feedback. And this is what we heard about from people. And this is gonna be an interesting slide. Yes, neck, shoulder, wrist, back pain. That's kind of up our alley things we do, but look at what else is going on. Fatigue, I'm, I'm actually doing a webinar tomorrow on fatigue management and you know, it, it's, it's it's in the, the impact on ergonomic risk and injuries. Talk about it a little bit here, but it's, it's something that's weighing on people. Mental health challenges. We saw a lot of issues when people especially were sent home. You're working from an environment that maybe isn't conducive. Yes, I have an office here. Most people sent home didn't have an office. They were working at kitchen tables on their couches. Oh, by the way, in the next room, my children are learning remotely and I got to make sure I'm taking care of them as well. So the stress that came about that and then layer on top of it, geez, my spouse is at work. Is he or she getting exposed? That whole summer really created an impact. And I don't think it's really gone away because even though quote unquote, we're getting back to normal. There's still the spike of Omicron. Yes, it's gonna reach its peak, but what's the next variant? People are just challenged. I could tell you in our household, we're just challenged every day as to which grocery store should we go to? Where should we, you know, should we go into a different county because of their rules versus the rules in our county? All these things weigh on people and what that mental stress does, it creates ergonomic risk. And so again, I want you to think about that. And you can see at the bottom that people who have mental health issues or stressors and things of that nature end up having issues around chronic pain uh, three times more likely. And then the work-life imbalance. You're gonna see a statistic here that says, I think people are spending about 11 hours in front of the, the screen. Well, my work, whether I was in an office or here, most of my work is in front of a screen or on phone calls and stuff like that, conference calls. But people who went home where you didn't have that break, you didn't have the ability to just stop into somebody's cubicle or office and say, hey, how was your weekend? What happened? Tell me, did you watch the game Sunday night? I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, so I'm on the losing end of that, but it was fantastic. You don't have those opportunities to have those conversations. And what we're finding is that people are spending an hour and a half to two hours more a, uh, a week, I think, online than they ever did before. So you can see some of the stressors. So. We all know, you all know that ergonomic injuries account for about one third, MSDs account for about one third. But when you look at the cost, it's about a 65 to $70 billion cost when you consider the direct and the indirect. And the indirect can be one X to five X of what the direct is. The indirect being that lost, uh, we've got trained new people, replacement wages while we got somebody off. 
lost productivity, whatever those things are. And I'll tell you, when we do our ROIs, we never calculate the indirect because I can't put a direct correlation of direct to indirect. But I will also tell you a lot of organizations don't account for their indirect. And I really encourage everybody to do a periodic once every two years evaluation of your indirect so that as you're proposing programs, you're talking to wherever you have to do up in the organization or sideways in the organization, whatever your role is, you're talking about the total cost factor. And if you don't have that indirect, it's like the iceberg. We all seen the iceberg that, you know, when it's above the water is only a partial of what you're seeing. So again, I encourage everybody to take a look at those indirect. So let's get into the three segments. Let's talk about ergonomic injuries. Back pain, still number one, still number one issue in disability. And when you think about it, this is direct and indirect. This is uh, National Safety Council's numbers, not mine, $120,000 on a potential back issue, it's a catastrophic injury, not medical only, not anything else. So if you think about it, if you're at 30X and you've got a four, time, four factor on your indirect, you're at about $120,000. I think National Safety Council even has on their website a calculator that can help you with that to think about those things. So if you're thinking about, okay, we operate on a 10% margin, hopefully much more, but we operate on a 10% margin that's a $1.2 million that you have to go out and get additional revenues. Your salespeople, your operation people have to generate another $1.2 million just to cover that one catastrophic injury. It's important that everybody understands that. That's why looking at the indirect is such an important component. And you know where these things come from, prolonged repetitive tasks, awkward static positions, vibrate. These are the things that we deal with day in and day out. And think about this, every seven seconds, there's an injury. And when I talked about musculoskeletal issues back in March, April of 2020, when we started talking to people, we saw a decline. A lot of that was, I think people were afraid to raise their hand because they didn't, you know, they didn't want to go to the doctor. They were afraid they might get sick. Maybe they were more careful of their surroundings than before. And three, because if you recall in the summer of 2020, up to 40 million people lost their job, whether it was for a week or whether it was permanent and everywhere in between, nobody wanted to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm in discomfort, I'm in chronic pain, I've got issues, I've strained. They worked through it, they powered through it. And maybe we're seeing the repercussions of that now with the quote unquote great resignation. But at the time, Marsh had indicated, Marsh Insurance had indicated a potential 12 to 16 percent upswing in musculoskeletal issues and i can tell you a lot of our clients saw that and i'm going to give you a case study here we have a client the last week that we were there in march of 2020 where we were in all 17 sites we had eight re work related issues across those 17 sites they were not injuries they were just incidents that our programs help keep them out of out of recordables and stuff like that eight Fast forward four months after we were let, let go and then came back full bore, the first full week we were in all 17 locations again. 84 work-related incidents, from eight to 84. Deconditioning, this particular company had backlogs of 30,000 units per site, uh, times 17 sites. They were working overtime, they were pushing their people, and that created that. So. That 16, 12 to 16% that uh, Marsh indicated was really coming through. Great, what can we do about it? A lot of different things here. I'm not gonna go through all of them, uh, but I'm gonna give you a case study. But you know, on-site therapy, when I talk about therapy, I don't mean physical therapy, because usually physical therapy relates to when somebody actually has an injury and you got an OSHA recordable. I'm talking about more of that wellness perspective, that preventative, that deep tissue work to eliminate the pain and discomfort. But that, with that, that's, that's not enough because all you're doing is addressing it when it happens. Start doing more body mechanics work and, and what we call pre-shift conditioning. What you won't see on here is the word stretch. Our philosophy is stretch and flex is dead. The reason being that stretching has a minimal impact for long-term sustainability. If you do conditioning, like an athlete conditions themselves to be able to move their body and a prime example is we work with baggage handlers and if you think about a baggage handler they grab a bag 
first they stretch for the bag beyond their, uh, their zone. Then they lift it five pounds to 50 pounds, twist in their torso 150 times a day. Well, we gave them programs that said, okay, if your torso is going to shift 150 times a day, we got to give you some warm ups that affect your torso twisting or affect the way you're going to lift the bag that's on the conveyor belt. It's not from the ground, it's on the conveyor belt. And giving them proper body mechanics and conditioning keeps people out of therapy and they, and they tend to do the right thing. And the reason we call it conditioning and mobility is because it's sustainable and it becomes intuitive and it becomes instinctive. We actually call our program instinctive movement, but what we do becomes instinctive to how they do their job and how they live their life. And then you got the work that you all are doing, ergonomic assessments. Uh, I suggest every employee, especially new hires, get uh, training we call ergo eyes, giving people ergo eyes. We call it ergonomic, ergo aware. Make them aware of their surroundings. Make sure they're looking for risk in the environment uh, and make sure that they have ergonomic eyes because we worked with an airplane manufacturer in uh, Kansas, one ergonomist for 10,000 employees on campus. We trained people to have ergo eyes so that they could see the risk because you can't be everywhere. If, you, if you're in a division, you've got responsibilities divisionally, you've got responsibilities corporately. If you're at a single site, you might have site responsibilities, divisional, and sometimes corporately. You can't be everywhere. So give people ergo eyes. Ergonomic software, there's desktop, but in this case, there's also software that can help uh, with AI, artificial intelligence. There's other software that can help non-ergonomists. It guides them through how to do an ergonomic assessment. It has 15 assessment tools built in like NIOSH and Liberty Mutual and all those things. And you all know about echoskeletons and wearables. Let me say one thing about technology right here, because I've done webinars on technologies. People say, well, what technology should I use for X, Y, and Z? The only thing I want to say about technology here, it's an enabler. It doesn't replace what humans have to do. The assessments you have to do, or if you do wearable technology, interpreting the data, the interventions that have to be done. So things like technology, they, you know, they, they drive the direction. Humans are going to drive the sustainable cultural change and the behavioral change. So here's that airline um, example. Aviation carrier, we worked with them pre-COVID, uh, about to go national when COVID hit. I just want to point out here, they gave us a subset of 200 people out of 4,000 uh, baggage handlers. These were frequent flyers as far as injuries, people that maybe they felt physically didn't have the full physical capacity to do the job on a sustained basis, high risk. It says 2.5%. That group was actually about 3%. That 40,000 is their number, not mine, because they were doing indirect. We worked with those folks. We did some ergonomic assessments. We did a lot of body mechanics training and, and pre-shift conditioning. We did our hands-on therapy, and we, and we really helped change their mindset to a more wellness-based mindset. You could see the, redult, the results, reducing it in stress levels. 91% of the people indicated that. Um, easier to do their job. All of those things, you could see, you know, higher morale, a lot of things. So that 200,000 was based on a group of 200 people that, and we used the two and a half percent incident rate. So you could see what the impact over eight months had with this group. And I can tell you in eight months, two things, the final outcome, we had zero incidents with that 200 people, reduced absenteeism, because that was a big thing with baggage handlers, and a 96% retention of learned behaviors once they were taught in a single 30-minute class the proper techniques and the pre-shift conditioning. Sustainability. So whatever program you're doing, and a lot of you are doing programs, and by the way, there's a lot of companies like Doran out there that do very good work, so this isn't uh, the commercial for Doran, but I'm giving you case studies, so as you evaluate how you want to approach it, you might have people internal, you might have athletic trainers on staff, you might have other people, organizations that you're already working with. Make sure you're getting data because data is important for you to really look at the efficacy of those programs to make strategic and tactical decisions because that's a big thing that we're about. We're all about data. So let's talk about remote workers and data. I said before, 58% of the workforce uh, moved home. It actually got as high as I think 75%. People working from home are reporting stress. 
Maybe these numbers are lower now, now that we're into 2022. But if it's not 90%, it's in the 60%. Half the work from home injuries are occurring from improper home setup. We had clients that just sent all their people home, their call centers, their CSRs, their engineers. We work with a chip maker. Their engineers all went home. They didn't have all the proper setup. They had maybe the equipment they were able to take home. They didn't have the proper setup. And so what we saw was we were kicked out, 11 sites. We were there 70 hours a week. A month and a half later, they call us and say, you can't come back on campus. And all our remote workers are now saying, Dorn has to help us. How are you going to do that? We'll talk about programs that can help people with that. But think about that. People don't have the proper setups. Not every company can supply an ergonomic chair, can supply a sit-stand desk at home, all the things that people might still be utilizing. Younger workers are more likely than older workers to experience pain and discomfort. And I'm going to tell you why. That might surprise you. I don't know if everybody can see me, but I'm holding my phone. Um, I have a stepdaughter. This is before I was in the safety business. She grew up staring down at her phone six hours a day, playing her Game Boy, playing whatever she's doing. The reality of it is they walk into the job with a pre-existing condition because when you're staring down for multiple years, you have a pre-existing condition that can be triggered. And they sit awkwardly. They sit on their legs. They, you know, they, they sit various ways that just don't make sense. And as you can see, two out of five Americans working from home feeling now increased pain levels, shoulders, wrists, and stuff. And I talked about this, 11 hours per day, that's an increase of about an hour a day, hour and a half a day that people were online. Virtual self-care massage, teaching people how to get rid of the pain and discomfort, not through, oh, just move your arm around, but going deep. Virtual ergonomic training and assessments desktop ergonomic software that self-assessment, self-correction tools that gives the employee the empowerment. One of our taglines is empowerment through education and engagement. Empower your employees to take care of things themselves. And by the way, you're gonna get a report that shows the risk and where Johnny's higher than Sally so you could focus your energy. So there's a lot, and obviously ergonomic furniture. This is that chip maker. Uh, the only thing on the right, this goes that, you know, we went from a single session the first week we went virtual to over 20 hours a week after 10 weeks, sustainability. And when you see these numbers over here, these are the results. Employees telling us 33% would have seen a healthcare professional. 77% re said they had reduced stress levels, improved morale, 92%. These are big numbers. It's that employee engagement that maybe we lost by sending people home. And, you know, we talk about that a lot. I talked about it mostly here. This is also your remote workers that maybe before COVID didn't get a lot of attention or got some attention through your LMS system with some different stretches and different programs, but didn't get the attention. They're going through the same thing. They've been doing it for years. Well, in the last two years, the rest of us have caught up to what your utility workers, your uh, service techs, all those people who work remotely or in small groups that they're not on site. You got to make sure that you're, you're giving them the same opportunity as others. And how you do that is get them on the safety committees, engage them in the process, get your remote workers, get your, uh, your safety techs on the same committees as your on site people. So their voice is heard and they're part of the conversation. And so when you look at things, look at programs that can bring singular or multiple solutions together, subscription-based solutions that can help you bring about a solution to these type of workers. I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to stop here and switch gears to the mental health side of things. Just some stats, 94% of workers are working stressed. Uh, half the U.S. workers suffer from mental health issues and, you know, since COVID hit some level. doesn't. It, and, and the word mental health, I just and I'm going to put all these up for the sake of time. You can read this as I get into something else here. The word mental health should not be a negative. We find in a lot of organizations, it's a dirty word. And I'm going to I'm going to give you uh, an example. There's a woman by the name of Maddie. She worked with and she, they're not clients. She worked with a software developer in Silicon Valley. She wrote an email on a Wednesday to the entire organization, including the CEO, that said, I'm taking the next two days off as mental health days. Well, 
The CEO wrote back and copied everybody in the organization and said, Maddie, thank you. Please take care of yourself because come Monday, we're kicking off the new project, blah, blah, blah. And I appreciate what you're doing to take care of yourself so you could take care of your customers. And I wonder how many organizations would cringe if they saw an email like that saying I'm tech and mental health days that went to the entire organization, including the CEO. And I can tell you there was a point in my life I probably would have cringed as well. Not anymore. You got to give access. And yes, you all have EAP systems. I'm not really talking about just that. Or if you just want to utilize the EAP systems, make sure they're robust enough to have apps for mental health. Make sure they have the ability to have the ability to have a place to, to, to you know, speak and, and, and give themselves a, a space, a safe place. But the key solutions, it's leadership. It starts with your organization, the people at, at your level, the people, if there are people above you, if you're at that senior level, it starts there. You got to do what that CEO did. You got to embrace it. You got to meet it where it's at. So having those preventive methods. Some of the things we already talked about, virtual assessments, virtual self-care programs that maybe are not part of your EAP program. Teaching people, you know, we have both a, a live and an on-demand version of virtual self-care that employees can, can access the live one. You know, they're working with a professional with the on-demand. They could take, they're sitting at a ball game with their kids and they got some back pain. They could just look at the app and see how to address that back pain. Not the same as being live, not the same as being on site, but there's tools out there now. Fatigue management programs. I said, I'm speaking tomorrow on fatigue. And fatigue is a huge, huge issue that people four years ago when I went to a fatigue webinar that the National Safety Council put out, not a webinar, a conference up in Seattle, it was 60% academics, 40%, um, probably 20% practitioners, 20% consultants. It's becoming more and more mainstream. The measurements of fatigue and how to address fatigue, which create can, can create catastrophic injuries. It's not just for drivers anymore. It's for people working on the production line, people working on that repetitive motion job that after coming back from COVID, there are 30,000 units behind in each facility. They're working hours and hours of overtime. If people aren't getting that required rest and you can't control what they do at night, whether they have a second job, whether they have a rough domestic environment, or whatever it might be, you can't control that. It all comes back into your organization. So making sure if your EAP systems aren't robust enough, partner with your wellness folks, or if you're a smaller organization where you can have more influence, look at some of these programs and, and bring them together. So the reality of it is, and here's just an example of a, a portal that has some mental health awareness, uh, education, personal well-being, and then our, our self-care programs, uh, the on-demand version. Uh, the, real, the reality of this is, let's take a holistic approach to the hybrid workforce we're all working within right now, and mental health, wellness, and ergonomic risk, they all go together. We probably intuitively knew that all along. Did our programs always match up to that? I would argue for most organizations not. We did a survey last spring and the larger the organizations, the more this really fit, the smaller the organizations, it was a little bit of an eye opening, but I will tell you the majority of the folks who took that survey said, yeah, we ought to be looking at something like this come, and at the time it was mid-21, so 2021 or 2022. I encourage you to do the research to, I think the access to this deck will be there, to look at some of these things, research them, ask professionals. Um, I'd say, you know, when it comes to things like apps, really align yourself, unless there's an app out there that's just a home run and that's the singular thing you want to do, that's great. But if you're not sure where to go, definitely partner with folks who are technology agnostic, that they don't promote only a singular technology, whether it's a wearable or whether it's a certain level of uh, programming. Make sure it's somebody that can walk a journey with you so that you're evaluating multiple pieces before you just jump into a singular solution. So it's important, though, to keep that NIOSH total worker health in mind that Rachel brought up in the beginning. And hopefully what I've done is try to just bring together 
some of these components together so that you all can take a look at them and say, how does this work for us? And, you know, uh, you know, I think we have a couple of minutes left before questions, but one thing that I would tell you is it's like anything you do, it's like project planning. You have to get some, you have to first think about what are our objectives as an organization? What do we want to, at the end of the day, if I look out two, three years, what does that look like? What does engagement of employees mean? What does empowerment of employees mean? And education is just the vehicle to get there. Technology is just the vehicle to get there. On-site therapy is the vehicle to get there. What are our objectives? What are our current, what's our current state? What's our data tell us? Data is important. And if you don't have it, bring somebody in who can help you get it. Then let's look at various paths. How can our organization, how does it absorb change? How does it absorb new programming, new technology? Some organizations could take on a lot, others can't. And I'm not talking just financially, I'm talking about how the culture, how things are adopted. Take a look at all those and really think about that. Then evaluate the different paths. And if you try one, it doesn't mean if it didn't work in the first 90 days, you just dump it because you don't wanna be the flavor of the month. Get the learnings, tweak it redo it, maybe introduce a second or third set of interventions. But there's a way to approach this in a way that meets those objectives. When you lay out that vision, you all are in a place, every single person on this call, I don't care what level you are in the organization, to be part of painting the vision. Some have more input than others, but be part of it. Because once you set those objectives, what does this look like two years from now, three years from now? How are we going to get there? What's our baseline? How does our organization adopt that? You're got, that? That'll help you move down that path. And if you need support on that, reach out to people who can support you on that. Um, Rachel, I think that's what we have. Uh, I'm definitely open to questions from the from the audience. I'd love to hear uh, people's experience. Uh, you know, I, we might have some questions early on, but hopefully we, we can hear people's experiences as well. We are out of time for the Q and A. But for everyone uh, that, that has submitted Q&A, do know that we're going to get those questions to Kevin. And the email for Kevin is on your screen right now. So please do feel free to reach out to him directly with some of those questions, uh, with some good questions coming up there that, we, that we'd like to make sure you get answered here. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. This session will be available in about a week at the digital session section of ergoexpo.com. Thank you, Kevin, for your time today, and thank you thank most you. of all to all of you who joined us today, and we look forward again to seeing you live in November at the National Ergonomics Conference and Ergo Expo. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Rach.